Okay, hi, I'm Pastor Cheryl. I'm coming to you today from my study in beautiful, sunny Florida. My message today is titled, People Get Ready. It is the message of John the Baptist while he was ministering in the wilderness along the Jordan River. Repent, the end is near. The wild-eyed zealot in a sandwich board shouting in our street has become a joke in our culture. But when it came to wild-eyed zealots, John the Baptist certainly fit the bill. The Bible tells us that he lived in the wilderness. He wore clothing made of camel skins and ate locust and honey for his dinners. I'm sure many of them thought of him as crazy John, but instead of writing him and his message off as the rantings of a lunatic, many came out to hear him preach. Now some came from curiosity and some from a deep interest in spiritual things. After all, there had not been a prophetic voice in Israel for over 400 years, and he caused quite a stir. John's message was simple. People get ready. Now, please join me in a word of prayer before we dig into John's message. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who are tuned into this important message today. I pray that your Holy Spirit will empower my words and move on the hearts of those who are watching. And I pray, Lord, that you will use this message to change lives for eternity and increase your kingdom. I give all power and glory and honor to you, Almighty God, in Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, please turn to Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. So he, beginning in verse 7, so he, John the Baptist, began saying to the crowds who were coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath of God that is to come? Therefore, produce fruit that is worthy of and consistent with your repentance. That is, live changed lives. Turn from sin and seek God in his righteousness. And do not even begin to say to yourselves as a defense, We have Abraham and our father as our Father, so our heritage assures us of salvation. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children or descendants for Abraham. For God can replace the unrepentant, regardless of their heritage, with those who are obedient. Verse 9, Even now the axe of God's judgment is swinging toward the root of the trees, so every tree that does not produce good fruit is being cut down and thrown into the fire. Wow! Well, John's message was urgent. John warned about the coming wrath of God and urging people to repent because God's judgment was about to commence. Look at verse 7 again. So he began saying to the crowds who were coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath of God that is to come? Now the scripture tells us that crowds of people came out to be baptized by John. Some people wanted to be baptized by John so they could escape eternal punishment, but they didn't want to turn to God for salvation. John had harsh words for such people. He knew that God values reformation above ritual. Is your faith rooted in a desire for a new changed life? Or is it only a vaccination? Or maybe an insurance policy against possible disaster? What motivates your faith? Is it fear of the future? Or a desire to be a better person in a better world? Now John very bluntly told the whole crowd that they were in a rotten condition. He said, you are a brood of vipers. Now in Genesis 3, Satan is pictured as a serpent or a viper. And God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. That's in Genesis 3.15. So when anybody says that you were the seed or the brood of a viper, <laughs> it, was this, it was the same as saying that you were just sons of the devil. And that's exactly what Jesus said in John 8.43 to another crowd. Jesus said, Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. Now, John the Baptist's message 
that we just read um, was also recorded in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel points out that many of the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming to John's baptism. And here, John specifically condemned them as a brood of vipers or a family of snakes. John was essentially calling the religious leaders deadly sons of serpents. See, the Pharisees and Sadducees were the religious leaders in Israel during the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. The Pharisees were the law keepers and promoters of tradition. And the Sadducees comprised the wealthier ruling class. Over the centuries, these two groups had become corrupt, legalistic, and hypocritical, and would eventually be responsible for crucifying Jesus, the Son of God. They earned their label, Brood of Vipers. The viper was seen to be an evil creature. Its venom was deadly, and it was also devious. The Hebrew scriptures, which the Pharisees knew well, associate the serpent with Satan in Genesis 3. And for John to call the Pharisees a brood of vipers implies that they bore satanic qualities. When John called the Pharisees a brood of vipers, he was pointing out that these men were deceitful, dangerous, wicked, and hypocrites. And John's audience would have understood John's reference about vipers. Farmers, then as now, often burned the stubble of their field to get the land ready for the next planting season. And as the fires neared the vipers' dens, the snakes would slither away from the flames, but they often did not escape being consumed. Snakes fleeing from the fire was a common sight, and John's words to the Pharisees would likely have brought that to mind. How could they think that they would escape the fire of God's judgment by relying on their own good works, which were not all that honest or good? John's calling them a brood of vipers was meant to make them aware of their own wickedness and call them to repent. Now John told the crowd that God's wrath is coming. What's God's wrath? Well, in our secular age, God's wrath is a foreign and unwanted truth. Nevertheless, the wrath of God is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. God's wrath, in perfect harmony with all of his divine attributes, is the holy action of retributive justice toward the persons whose actions deserve eternal consequences. In America's Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Here's a part, an excerpt from that famous sermon. Jonathan Edwards preached, The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one that holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire he is a purer eye than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. Edwards illustrates the perilous position of the lost. Those without Christ dangle over the flames of hell like, like a spider over a flame. This kind of preaching ignited revival as it set salvation in the context of God's holy wrath. Now by contrast, God's wrath has been eliminated from many 20th century pulpits. Jonathan Edwards' warnings against hell have been replaced by Dale Carnegie style positive messages of winning friends and influencing people. But if we don't understand God's hatred of sin, the character of God becomes misshapen and the universe bends toward human individuals, love becomes pure affirmation. God becomes a personal friend who assists us in all of life's difficulties. Whole ministries have been built with the focus on the power of positive thinking. In the 21st century, God's wrath is not a popular divine attribute. Nonetheless, the God of the Bible remains the same, as Nahum chapter 1 verse 2 declares. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. 
The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Despite what is or is not preached from many modern pulpits, the Bible is full of language describing God's wrath. There's a consistency about the wrath of God in the Old Testament. It's not a capricious passion, but the stern reaction of the divine nature toward evil. Wrath is the vengeance that God takes toward all forms of wickedness. God's anger toward sin is real and deadly. Adam and Eve were exiled from Eden. The worldwide flood. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The defeat of Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. And the incineration of Nadab and Abihu are all examples of God's wrath. Each of these instances display God's zeal for his holiness. God cannot withstand sin, and while he may delay his justice, he will not deny his holiness. God's wrath is never hasty or disconnected from his other attributes. As Exodus 34, 6-7 states, Yahweh is slow to anger. You see, God's patience is another aspect of his divine glory, and one that demonstrates his wisdom to know when to be patient and when to act in justice. God's slowness to anger should never be viewed as motivation for repentance. Oh, excuse me, or I back that up. God's slowness to anger should always be viewed as motivation for a repentance, and never a denial of his justice. From Genesis to Malachi, we find a consistent testimony of God's wrath against sin. This was true in all nations and in all periods. This carries over into the New Testament. Now some have argued the New Testament God is wholly loving in contrast to the Old Testament God who is wholly vengeful. From the ministry of John the Baptist to the wrath of the Lamb in Revelation, the promise of future judgment runs through the New Testament and it serves as a backdrop for the message of salvation. Salvation, according to Christ and the Apostles, is a salvation from God's wrath. See, God's wrath waits for the future day of judgment. In the Gospel message, God propitiates His wrath by personally taking our punishment on the cross. The cross of Christ reveals God's divine satisfaction through His own divine substitution. God himself put on an earth suit and was born as a man, Jesus Christ, to provide the perfect sacrifice to pay the debt for our sins in our place. See, God formed humanity to bring him glory. Yet because we rebelled against his holy standard, the perfect judge of the universe has declared that he will pour out his wrath upon those without repentance or faith in his Son who have sinned against him. The wrath of God is not the main message of the gospel, but the biblical gospel cannot be understood apart from it. On the cross, God the Son bore the full weight of divine judgment, even as he volunteered himself to accept the full measure of God's wrath. As we learn from his prayers in Gethsemane, there was no other way for wrath to be removed but through his death on the cross. And for all those who trust in Christ, this punishment is removed. But for those who refuse Christ, God's wrath remains. Now at the final judgment, God will separate those whose wrath was borne by Christ from those who will bear the punishment themselves. The eternal realities of heaven and hell can only be understood with a proper understanding of God's wrath. God's love is a pure and holy love, and just as, call, as God calls his people to hate evil, so God hates evil. God's wrath magnifies the holiness of his love. God's love is actually defined by his hatred towards sin and the gift of his Son to propitiate his wrath. You see, God's holiness cannot tolerate sin. Sin offends our holy God and it separates us from Him. 
And because God is holy, he cannot ignore, excuse, or tolerate sin as if it doesn't matter. Sin cuts people off from him. It forms a wall to isolate God from the people that he loves. People who die with their life of sin unforgiven separate themselves eternally from God. God wants everyone to be saved, but he cannot bring them into his holy presence unless their sin is removed. Have you confessed your sin to God, allowing him to remove it? The Lord can save you if you turn to him. Okay, let's move on to verse 8. John's message to the crowd continues. Therefore, produce fruit that is worthy and consistent with your repentance. That is, live changed lives. Turn from sin and seek God in his righteousness. And do not even begin to say to yourselves as a defense, oh, we have Abraham for our father. And so our heritage assures us of salvation. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children or descendants for Abraham. For God can replace the unrepentant, regardless of their heritage, with those who are obedient. John challenged his audience to turn their lives around. Change your life. Stop sinning. Let your outward life reflect the inner changes. Repentance has two sides. Turning away from sin and turning toward God. To be forgiven, we need to do both. We can't just say, yeah, I believe, and then live any way that we want to. And neither can we simply live a morally correct life without reference to God, because that alone cannot bring forgiveness from sin. Choose to rid your life of any sins that God points out. Put your trust in Him alone to save yourself from sin's consequences. Now many of the crowd listening to John were counting on being Jews to get them into heaven. John told them, your heritage will not save you. Jews were God's chosen people, the apple of his eye. This had to be shocking to his audience, who believed that only Jews were going to heaven. Beware of spiritual pride, of thinking that only those from your particular ethnic group or denomination are the only ones going to heaven when they die. God looks at the heart. That's what matters to him. Now, many of John's listeners were stunned when he said that being Abraham's descendants was not enough for God. The religious leaders relied more on their family line than on their faith for their standing with God. For them, religion was inherited. But a relationship with God is not handed down from parent to child. Everyone, everyone has to find it on his or her own. God has children but he doesn't have grandchildren. Our salvation is available only through Jesus Christ. There's no middle ground with God. Those who are truly seeking God will accept Christ and his message. But sadly, there are those who reject Jesus because they don't like what he says. We cannot pick and choose which parts of God's word we want to obey. We can't rely on anything other than Jesus to find salvation. Don't rely on someone else for your salvation. You may have a praying grandma, and that's a wonderful thing, but grandma's prayers won't guarantee that you're going to heaven. You may have been raised in a Christian home, and that's a wonderful thing, but being raised in a Christian home will not guarantee that you're going to go to heaven. You may even attend church every Sunday and that is a wonderful thing. But regular church attendance will not guarantee that you'll be saved unless you put your own faith in Jesus and then exercise your faith by acting on it every day. John told his audience to produce good fruit. Well, what's good fruit? Faith and works are inseparable. Faith without works is a lifeless faith. You see, your repentance must be tied to action or it isn't real. Is the fruit of your faith ripening as your faith grows? Or is it rotting as you fail to act upon what God shows you? See, John's message was a serious one. 
we need to take a, we need to pay attention to it. Let's look at verse nine. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is swinging toward the root of the trees. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is being cut down and thrown into the fire. John says that judgment is coming soon. The axe of God's judgment is coming. The world will be judged and every tree or person that does not produce good fruit will be cut down. Remember, repentance must be tied to action or it isn't real. Faith and works are inseparable. Faith without works is dead. We are called to produce good fruit. Now John talks about trees being cut down and thrown into the fire. What fire is John talking about? He's talking about hell. We don't hear much about hell these days. <clears throat> Those old fire and brimstone sermons from Jonathan Edwards' day They've morphed into a soft, encouraging, or entertaining messages that many of them more resemble inspirational TED Talks than the Gospel. The hard truth is that there's a real heaven and a real hell. Hell is a place of eternal punishment, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is the final and eternal state of the wicked after the resurrection and the last judgment. See, salvation is not fire insurance. Don't think just reciting a prayer or walking a church aisle is all you need to go to heaven. Salvation is a life-changing event. You make the choice to follow Jesus instead of following the ways of this fallen, dog-eat-dog -dog world. There are no second chances in hell. In the end, death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire and God's judgment will be finished. The lake of fire is the ultimate destiny of everything wicked. Satan, the beast, the false prophet, the demons, death, Hades, and everyone who does not place their trust in Jesus Christ. There are no gray areas in God's judgment. If by faith we have not identified with Christ, confessing him as Lord, there will be no hope no second chances, and no other repeal. This, this tiny little moment of eternity that we call life, it's our only opportunity to make this critical choice. Will you choose to spend eternity with Jesus or choose to spend it with the devil and his angels? Now, I can't talk you into accepting Jesus as your savior. All I can do is present the facts that are so clearly outlined in Scripture. This is your decision. The Bible tells us that no one comes to God unless the Holy Spirit prompts them. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God is knocking on the door of your heart right now and that you are willing to take this crucial step of faith. God loves you and he wants you to spend eternity with him. But because he is just and holy, unless a person accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they will be condemned to an eternity in hell. Like John the Baptizer, I want to encourage you to repent. Turn your life around and make Jesus your Lord and Savior. This is a free gift. There is nothing that you can do to earn it. Simply tell God that you're sorry for your sins, that you want to follow Jesus and Make him the Lord of your life and ask him to save you. Just talk to him in your own words. This is a prayer that God always hears and answers. So today we've looked at John the Baptist's message to the crowds that followed him. His message was simple. People, get ready. God's wrath is coming. Repent. Change your life or face eternal consequences. I echo this message. People, get ready. Time is short. Please don't delay in making this very important decision. May God bless you richly until we meet again. Also, if you would like uh, to contact me for prayer or to let me know that you have made a salvation decision, please send me an email at Cheryl Pickford at gmail.com. 
I'd be delighted to pray for you and help you get started in your new life in Christ. God bless you.